Dr. Christian's office. Oh, Mrs. Burke, how nice. You're home from the hospital already. How does baby like his new home? The Vaseline Program, presenting another Dr. Christian prize play called And Not to Yield by Betty F. Revert of Downers Grove, Illinois. Starring Gene Herschel as Dr. Christian with Helen Clare in the role of Judy Price. Well, of course he cried. You can't blame Baby for crying when his tender little skin is chafed and sore. Oh, that was good advice. Vaseline petroleum jelly is just the thing. Massaged lightly into chafed or touchy places or in the folds of skin where clothing rubs, Vaseline petroleum jelly always makes a baby feel comfortable. So pure and gentle and so safe you can use just as much of it and as often as you wish. Why is it so good? Well, Vaseline petroleum jelly not only soothes baby's irritated skin, it forms a sort of protective film, and that helps keep out infection when the skin is broken. And besides, of course, it helps promote healing. And everything it does for baby, it'll do for you, too, when your skin is chafed or inflamed. Lots of uses? It certainly has. It's a good idea to keep an extra jar or tube of Vaseline petroleum jelly handy. Okay, Mrs. Burke, you say hello to baby for me. Bye. <laughs> It's 11 o'clock on a very rainy night. With the lights of River's End all behind them, Judy Price is driving Dr. Christian down a muddy, narrow, winding country road. Dr. Christian, you know who lives down at the foot of the hill in that funny, patched-together little house? No, of course I don't. The old guy and Blubber. <laughs> Blubber. Well, that name always makes me laugh a little. And the old man, what a pair. How much do you know about them, Dr. Christian? Why, I've seen him off and on, of course, ever since they came here. When was it? Well, about seven years ago. Oh, I, I, I talked to Bravo occasionally, but I never talked to the old man. I, I didn't think he was real the first time I saw him. Tall, gaunt, and a beard all over his face, slouching along with a pack of children running along beside him. All the kids in River's End love him. They tag him all over the place, and he gives them a great deal of beauty. Mm, yes, in what way? Well, he does it with words. He tells them stories of great deeds and legends of old forgotten lands, and he gives them poetry. Why, Judy, have you been listening to him, too? Whenever I get a chance. I've never really talked to him, and he's never really talked to me. But I've listened to him talk to the children, and just listening to him made beauty for me, too. I see, I see. Is it the old man who is ill? Yes, it is. I'm worried about him. But if he wanted a doctor, he'd send for one. Now, look, that man couldn't talk as he does to children and not be a good man. It wouldn't be possible. But there's some mystery there. And now he's ill and... Uh, Bella, slow can't... down a little, Judy. What kind of mystery? Well, it's quite simple. When the plant converted to war work, the old guy tried to get a job there, too. I heard all about it. He begged them to take him, but they wouldn't. Why not? As badly as the need men. Because he wouldn't tell them anything about himself, what his name was, or where he came from, or anything. And they wouldn't take a chance on him. And now, for the last two days, he's been ill. But I still can't go in as a doctor if I'm not called for. You can go as a friend, can't you? But I don't know him. Then it's time you did. I'm going down there as a friend to see if I can do anything for those two big babies who won't ask anybody for anything. You just sit here in the rain and hatch out some more professional ethics. Uh, Judy, wait a minute. Judy! Oh, I don't know why I let myself get choked into things like this. Judy! Hey, wait for a friend! <laughs> What do you want? I'm busy. I'm Judy Price, Blubber, remember? And Dr. Christian's with me. Oh, gee, I've been praying, honest I have. But I didn't know prayers could be answered so soon. Dr. Christian, come in, Dr. Miss Judy, come in. Hey, boss, boss, here's Dr. Christian. You'll think she up, see if he don't. Blubber? 
I told you not to call a doctor. I didn't. Honest, boss. But you didn't tell me I couldn't pray for one, so I did. And here he is. You ain't going to be mad at me for praying for, are you, boss? Huh? You dough-headed buffoon, you lump of maternal complex, you... Gee, thanks, boss. Blubber, your manners. Help our guests out of their very damp coats. Get chairs for them. Brew some tea. Extend our hospitality. Gee, sure, boss. Come in, come in. I mean, now that you're already in, sit down. Give me your coats, Miss Judy, Dr. Christian. Here, Blubber. Show me where the tea is. I'll make it. I need something hot. Is the kitchen back here? I'll bring one of the lamps, but you don't need the help, and I can't. I can make good tea. Honest, I do. And I'm a pretty good cook. The cup's right. Nice. <laughs> I'm not soliciting business, believe me, Miss Price. My secretary and nurse heard that you were ill and wanted to visit you as a friend. Sit down, Dr. Christian. As friends, you are both very welcome. I have long been indebted to Miss Price for her smiles. And because she, too, likes to peer through magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas, in fairy lands forlorn. Victor Jeremy. You are Victor Jeremy. Gee, boss, he knows we've been found out. Dr. Christian, what did you say? Well, I... I didn't mean to startle all of you like that. Forgive me, Mr. Jeremy. It was your voice just then. You see, I heard you many times in years gone by in all your famous parts. I was one of your fans. Sit down, all of you, please. Let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the deaths of kings. Dr. Christian, your Hippocratic oath obliges you to respect the confessions of the sickbed, does it not? And your nurse as well? You may be sure that neither duty nor I will do any talking. Do you want us to leave now? If I insist upon your obligations as a doctor, then you must command mine as your patient. <laughs> Miss Price, don't look at me like that. Have you never seen a ghost before? What? I assure you this one is too tired to clank a single chain or emit even the tiniest shriek. All I can do is to lie here wrapped in my winding sheet. Oh, forgive me for staring, but that you should be Victor Jeremy is a little too startling for me. Why, you were the greatest actor in our country, probably the world. I've read about you many, many times. No doubt you have. Then you must have read, too, that I was one of the biggest rotters in this country, probably the world. Too much wine, too many women, not enough song to still the clamor of the press. Oh, please, you must not excite yourself. Honey, boss, you was just a rotter sometimes when you was more drunk than usual. And you didn't mean nothing by it then, not to say serious meaning. Thanks, Blubber. It's an old story and not interesting, merely sordid. A beautiful young wife married to an old rounder. Too many flesh pots. My wife left me, took my son with her. She had every reason to do so. I don't know how or why she stuck by me as long as she did. Finally, I sickened even myself. It was much easier to walk out on my reputation as a drunkard than it was to live up to it. Blubber came along, a barnacle on an old boat. I couldn't scrape him off, but I tried hard enough. Well, gee, you hired me to take care of you, didn't you? I was his masseuse, doctor. When he was in the acting business, I mean. I was a good masseuse, too. I'd get him sobered up and thump him around so he could get on a stage... We had to keep hunting them up in places and lugging them around. And, and Have you ever tried to fire incarnate loyalty, Dr. Christian? I wouldn't try to. Well, Chief Boss, you heard me look after you, didn't you? What do you think I am? A, 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 one of these here way wage slaves? That's all there is to the story. As the old guy of River's End, I'm happy that the dead past bury its dead. But that's not all there is to the story, not by a long sight. Look at them pictures on a wall, Doctor. You too, Miss Judy. Look at him. <laughs> Such a meddlesome house, do you hear? I ain't gonna shut up. Because why? Because it ain't right that you should lie here eating your heart out. I can't take it no more. I'm human too. Honest I am. The kid there on the wall. Look at him. That's Michael. Mr. Jeremy's son, I imagine. But I don't think that's should... Michael, all right. There he is at the age of six months. And there's a year old. And there he's, he's riding his first bicycle. And there he's just before he's been confined. And there he's in high school. And that last week, that newspaper clipping, that's the way he looks now that he's in the army. My son... <laughs> My son has nothing to do with this discussion. Bobby, you're fired. Do you hear me? Fired. Sure, boss. Okay. Then I quit. When I'm going to get this off my chest, well, I got a chance. Look, doctor. When the missus left the bus here, she took the kid with her. 
The boss says, okay. See, like it didn't mean nothing. But he loved that kid more than everything in the world. And after that, his, his heart wasn't even in acting no more. It was with the kid. Only he never wanted to see him, not once, or wrote to him or nothing. The only way to remove a malignant growth is to cut it out. Don't you agree, Doctor? I don't think that human beings can dispose of emotions, not vital, life-giving emotions, with surgery. I think the scars do more damage. As a father, I had failed. Without me, my son could lead a decent, normal life. He took his mother's name after the divorce. He is now Michael Hill, not Michael Jeremy. I have no part in his life. Yeah, but now that his ma is dead and he's in the army... You suggest that I crawl to his attention, the has-been, the relic of the past, the ghost that wouldn't stay in the grave where it belonged? I tell you, I am dead to the world, to all of it. And I'm going to stay dead now. Get out, all of you. Get out and let me have some peace. <laughs> Gee, he's, he's going to doctor do something. I'll try. Judy, where's my bag? Bravo. Bring the lamp over here. And hurry. Uh, Judy, is there anything scheduled for tomorrow that I can't possibly put off for a day? Tomorrow? Let's see now. No operation. Surprise, not even a baby. Good, because I'm going to leave town tonight and take all day tomorrow off. And cancel everything. I can get on the train tonight and uh, I'll be there tomorrow morning and back tomorrow night. Dr. Christian, what are you talking about? Victor Jeremy's son is stationed at Camp Ridgeway. His son? Michael Hill? Blubber traced him down. Blubber has been writing to everybody. Not uh, mentioning Victor's name, of course. Just trying to get information. He came over this morning before he went to work to tell me he'd just found out the camp. And you're going down there and bring him back? Well, Blubber wanted me to write to him and ask him to come. And since there isn't time for letter writing, I'm going down and talk to the boy. And you'll bring him back with you. Kidnap him if you have to. Good luck, friend. <laughs> Lieutenant Hill reporting, sir? Good, good. At ease, Lieutenant. Dr. Christian, this is Lieutenant Michael Hill. Dr. Christian. How do you do, Lieutenant? How do you do, sir? Dr. Christian has come all the way from River's End to see you, Lieutenant. Well, I'm going out. You can talk here in the office. Oh, uh, by the way, Lieutenant, are you forgetting that you have a leave coming to you whenever you apply for it? I won't be applying. Thank you, just the same, sir. Up to you. If you change your mind, the leave still goes. Good day, gentlemen. Good day. Well, I suppose you're a little bewildered, Lieutenant Hill. Well, frankly, yes. Yes, sir, I, I don't know anything about River's End. Oh, it's a nice little town, but you're not interested in that. You should be interested in one person who lives there, though. Your father. My... I have no father. You are making some sort of mistake. You are Michael Hill Jeremy? My name is Hill, Dr. Christian. Just Michael Hill. You hate your father so very much, Lieutenant. Hate him? I don't think it's possible to hate something that doesn't exist, and I assure you that my father ceased to exist for me years ago. Many years ago. Your father and Blubber have been living in River Sand for the last seven years. Wait, you must remember Blubber. Remember him? Of course. So Blubber stuck with him. Well, he deserves a better cause. Have you never wondered where your father was and where he had been all this time and why he dropped out of fame and money into complete obscurity the way he did? I tell you, I don't think about him. Not at all. Why should I? Has he ever once thought about me? All the time, Michael. <laughs> there are nine pictures of you on the walls of his little home. Why, I know what you looked like from the age of six months on. Pictures of me? <laughs> I don't know who he's trying to fool, sir. Whether it's you or just himself. But from the time of the divorce, he has never communicated with me at all. 
When Mother died a couple of years ago, I thought then that if he were still alive and read about it, he might get in touch with me. But he didn't. Not one word. Well, he thought that going out of your life was the best gift he could give you, Michael. He was ashamed of what he had done to himself and to your mother. He wanted you to grow up and forget him. And I have done a good job of it. He's very ill now. And as a doctor, I don't think I can save him. Oh, he won't try. Blubber can't help him anymore. You're the only person who could. I thought he would drink himself to death in less time than this. I don't think he's had a drink since he came to River's End. He, he isn't drinking now? No. Then he... I mean, if he has straightened up, if he had willpower enough to do that, why... Why didn't he come back to me as a father, as a real father would have come? Pride. He thought you wouldn't want to see him. He was too proud to beg for the one thing he wanted. The affection of his son. I'm sorry, Doctor. You're a good advocate for him. But I'm not having any. The verdict's already in as far as I'm concerned. I don't see any point in discussing this anymore. Well, I'll admit that I'm a meddling old fool, Lieutenant. But there's just one thing I should like to say before I go. Yes? All of you young men going out to war today are going out because we, the older men, made mistakes. Oh, we know that now. We know that for all our faults of omission and commission, you young boys are paying the price now. But we are paying the price too in having to live with those mistakes eating at our hearts and minds constantly. It doesn't do very much good for any of us to come to you and say, forgive us. But that's the way we feel. And it doesn't help either to remember that when we made most of those mistakes, we were a lot younger ourselves. Goodbye, Lieutenant. <laughs> You sit here and I'll get some... Lover, stop plucking round like a weak-witted hen. Yes, sir. Judy's no invalid for you to hover over. Sit down, my dear. Just to look at you does me more good than all the evil concoctions your venerable employer pours down my unresisting gullet. A shame on your boss. Gullet ain't no way to use it in the presence of a nice dame. <laughs> Believe me, Blubber, I've heard the word before. And as for those concussions of mine, the fat lot you know about them, you pour most often down the sink. Naturally, what did you expect? Put that Venus thermometer in your sock and throw the stethoscope under the bed. Give me conversation, man, not professional routine. Where were you yesterday? I missed you. I, I had to go on a little trip. Business. Bad business. Shouldn't have gone. Ah. No fool like an old fool. Oh, I like old fools. All of them. It's just young fools I don't have any use for. Gee, Miss Judy, that's the nicest thing you ever said to me. <laughs> oh, if that's one of them kids again sneaked out of the body, I'm going to give them what for. I comb them out of my pancakes in the morning, fight my way through them at night. Do they worry me down to a mere shadow? Stop singing your maternal theme song and open the door, you unleavened lump of rank hypocrisy. Yes, boss. You didn't bake all those donuts for me. Okay, boss, but I still say some kids don't know enough to go to bed at no Blubber. Time. Do you do you recognize me, Blubber? It's Michael. And now remove your monstrous hulk from the doorway, Blubber, and let me see who our visitor is. It's, it's Michael, Father. You see, Dr. Christian, I... I changed my mind. I hoped you would. Father, aren't you glad to see me? Michael. <coughs> Michael. It's all right. Michael, here, you get on this side and hold him up on the pillow. Yeah, that's the way. Oh, Judy, break that ampoule. Yes, Doctor. Thank you. Now, let him rest for just a few minutes. Michael. Michael. 
I'm here, Father. Here's my hand. Don't try to talk. But you're going to be all right, do you hear? You're going to be all right. I've wanted and needed a father too many years to lose him now. Do you hear that, Dr. Christian? No, I heard it all right. Then you better bring me a double order of pills tomorrow. I'm going to begin taking them. Double? I'll treble it. This is my son. My own Telemachus. Michael, do you remember your Tennyson? I've never forgotten anything you ever read to me, Father. Then you know how I feel now. As did the aged Ulysses. It is not too late to seek a newer world. Though much is taken, much abides. Though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts. Made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And the curtain descends on another Dr. Christian prize play with our star Gene Hersholt waiting to greet you. Men, do you scare easy? <laughs> that scare you, fellas? Or does your hair always stand on end? <laughs> Never mind. Just remember that unruly hair and loose dandruff are signs of dry scalp. And that's something to get after with Vaseline hair tonic. Yes, Vaseline hair tonic checks dry scalp because one, it supplements natural scalp oils, and two, it contains no alcohol or other drying ingredients. Only five drops of Vaseline hair tonic a day. That's all you need. Applied each morning with a comb or directly on the scalp, it'll banish dryness and keeps your hair neatly groomed. Then, before each shampoo, apply Vaseline hair tonic liberally and give your scalp a vigorous massage. This will loosen dandruff scales, stop itchy tightness. Remember, for hair that looks good and a scalp that feels good, use Vaseline hair tonic regularly. Vaseline hair tonic is one of the many Vaseline brand products made by the Cheese Bro Manufacturing Company, owners of the trademark Vaseline. And now, here is Gene Herschel. Thank you very, very much. Well, the play you just heard was written by Betty F. Prevert who manages to combine writing radio scripts with the arduous domestic problems of wartime, wartime life and lives with a husband and son in Downers Grove, Illinois. Now, I've been asked to remind you to give your support again this year to the annual appeal for funds for the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. These stricken children need your dimes and dollars. Your generous contributions in previous years have been tremendously valuable in the fight against infantile paralysis. Don't slacken in your effort now. For next week, we plan to present another prize-winning play called And a Little Child by Edith Neff and Unda Hamron. And so we uh, invite you all to uh, listen again next Wednesday evening, same time and same station. Until then, I'll say good night. Cracked lip, friendly tip. Zip. Healing starts almost instantly with Vaseline lip ice. Get it tonight. In two sizes at 10 and 25 cents, Vaseline lip ice.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.